Does the focus on blockbuster temporary exhibitions cause us to miss treasures found in our own permanent collections? The Los Angeles Times posed this very question to a dozen curators and art specialists who then composed a list of the best museum pieces throughout the region. Eleven artworks were chosen from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Profoundly varied pieces range from the ancient to the contemporary. We call them the Magnificent Eleven. Here we have the portrait of two young women who happen to be the cousins, the first cousin of the great Impressionist painter Edgar Degas. Degas was French, but he was also partly Italian. He spent time actually in Italy and was very fond of his Italian cousins. As you see, the portrait is a bit unsettling when you look at it because it looks unfinished, and it is unfinished. It is a painting that Degas always kept with him. He had a very long life. He dies in the early years of the 20th century, and uh, he had it actually in his apartment in Paris. It was after his death that the painting was sold uh, with all his belongings, and it's at that time only that the painting became known. Ever since, it has been in every major Degas exhibition held wherever in the world. I think that Degas was uh, fond of this painting for personal reasons. He never saw them, I think, at all after he did these portraits because in the 19th century, people did not travel as easily as we do today, and therefore people were, were separated sometimes for lives. And, but he always lived with the memory of these cousins. The same way he was also very fond of another part of his family that was American, and they lived in New Orleans. And he went also to New Orleans and did their portrait. He was very moved by, the, by these two parts of his family, the non-French parts of his family, the Italian and the American one. Thea Selman's Untitled, affectionately known around here as The Comb, is this marvelous incongruous sculpture. One might think of it as a pop sculpture. It's certainly an ordinary tortoiseshell comb blown up to over life size. But it has an interesting connection to art of the past. Selman's likes to say that it reminded her of a comb which sat on her mother's dresser but it also recalled a favorite painting, which she knew by reproduction, a work by the Belgian surrealist René Magritte called Personal Values, where we see an ordinary room, a bedroom, with over life-size familiar objects. This comb has been plucked out of Magritte's imagination and made full scale by Via Selmans. If you look at it, you'll see that the artist has carefully built up the surface and fabricated this over life size comb. So for her, the process of creation is so much a part of the magic of the work of art. Uh, this painting is the Magdalene with the uh, smoking flame by the French artist Georges de Latour, who is a 17th century artist, and the painting was done around 1638-40. This style reflects Caravaggio. Caravaggio was a man who used uh, light in a very peculiar, very different way, very uh, innovative uh, fashion. He represented the light itself in the picture. And Georges de Latour does the same thing. As you can see in this painting, the Magdalene is a young woman, if you want, is uh, seated looking at the candle. And uh, what you see, in fact, are the shadows cast by that candle on the figure and on the environment. And that, which seems to us very uh, simple was in fact a great innovation in the early part of the 17th century. Many artists following the example of Caravaggio in Italy did it. In other parts of Europe people adopted this, uh, this style. Latour's work is very rare. Uh, there are perhaps, let me guess, perhaps 50 paintings known to be by him in the world. The uh, painting at LACMA is really one of the very, very best.
This is one of our most important pieces in the collection, particularly among our early material, and it is from the identifiable, very important site of Sanchi. It was originally in one of the gateways, which were built around the first century AD, that surround the monument, very elaborate, tall gateways, each some 30 feet. Sanchi, the site, is of a stupa, a reliquary mound, and often the bones or hairs of the Buddha are interred in it and it commemorates the birth of the lifetime of the Buddha and his parinirvana or his death. The sculpture is an image of two endorsed tree dryads. Endorsed means back to back and dryads are nature spirits. If you look at it, you notice it is very voluptuous and it is standing next to a tree that is flowering. The voluptuousness of the image represents its fertility and the symbolism is the fertility of motherhood, which is equated with the fertility of nature. And it's specifically paired with a blossoming tree because in ancient Indian poetry, there's the story of the beautiful woman who causes a tree to blossom at her mere touch. The piece is from the Nasli and Alice Hermonic collection, which was acquired by the museum in 1969. It is the museum's core collection. It is one of the earliest and is certainly one of the most important, and it's from one of the most major monuments in India. Ed Keenholz's marvelous, engaging, oftentimes provocative sculpture, the Backseat Dodge 38, is a piece which with history tends to be viewed, I think, somewhat um, almost affectionately. It's amazing. This is the piece which created such a ruckus in 1966. And when we encounter it now, it's this kind of charming blue flocked dodge. And it has a, a kind of sense of poignancy to it. And yet it carries with it so much history. I remember years ago taking a group of kindergartners through the, through the museum and they're all sitting cross-legged and looking at this sculpture which of course in the 1960s they would have almost been you know forbidden to look at and I looked at it and I talked to them about it and I asked them what did they think was going on? They paused, one of them raised their hands and said oh I know it's don't drink and drive and I thought my how times have changed. This painting is a great landscape by the fabulous uh, 19th century artist Paul Cézanne, who is certainly one of the greatest artists of the century. And uh, it is called in French Soubois, which is hard to translate, but it means like something like in the forest, if you want. Uh, Cézanne was famous for very classical landscapes, for a landscape that had a lot of structure in them. When you look at his typical landscapes, you see a mountain, you see trees that in a way almost create a grid on the canvas, They'll give it a very geometric kind of structure. And here you see something completely different. This painting was done in 1884 at a moment when a lot of influences played on Cézanne and he was perhaps looking at things that were completely unrelated to what he had done in the past. And suddenly he discovers almost colors in a way that is explosive and uh, if you look at this painting carefully and you try to recognize every element, something that you can do in most of Cézanne's paintings, you recognize a, a tree, uh, a branch, a leaf, everything is very carefully detailed in a way and here it's something very different. Although it's not impressionist, it's not fuzzy like an impressionist paintings, there is still a sense of structure and order and form and shape and all that, but it is much more, much freer than most of his paintings. So it is absolutely unique. Lacma is very fortunate to own 10 pieces of furniture from the Blacker House. Charles Sumner and Henry Mather Green were two of the most important architects of the American arts and crafts movement, and the Blacker House is one of their most outstanding creations. It was commissioned by the Blacker family in 1907, and for this house, the Green brothers designed absolutely everything. They designed the house itself, they designed the gardens, they designed the metalwork, the furnishings, the light fixtures. 
It was what was called by the Germans a complete Gesamtkunstwerk, which means a complete work of art. Part of the goal of the arts and crafts movement was to design democratically accessible, to design for the great middle classes. The Greens furniture doesn't fit into that category. This is one-off furniture made for one specific commission. One of the goals was to reflect nature in the piece itself. The handle on the sideboard looks like the trunk of an oak tree and it's meticulously carved. The greens were very popular at the turn of the century. By the 1920s, though, the style was no longer popular, the greens went out of favor, and in the 1940s, the house and its furnishings were sold very cheaply. All 10 pieces were purchased from the Anderson family, who is the family that um, purchased the pieces in a garage sale, sidewalk sale in the 1940s. So those were, nobody wanted them. This one family bought many of the furnishings and then sold them off in the 1980s. They're a combination of consummate craftsmanship, of consummate design. They're both uniquely American at the same time as they show international influences. They would not have been made the way they were made unless they were for a home in California. So it, it stands for a lot of, of art history. Soap Bubbles is a painting by a French artist of the 18th century named uh, Jean-Baptiste Simeon Chardin. Uh, it was painted around 1733, and uh, it is a painting which is slightly different from his other works. Chardin was known above all as a painter of still lives, of objects. He painted fruit, vegetables, dead rabbit, uh, pots and pans, and was famous for those compositions. But occasionally, only on very rare occasion, he added a human figure in his, in his images. And the painting here in Los Angeles in what is one of those rare examples. The subject itself is a young man blowing a soap bubble. That was actually a, a favorite pastime, believe it or not, of young children in the 18th century. And uh, it was a subject that was occasionally represented by artists because it gave them the opportunity to paint something very challenging, which is a soap bubble. When you think of it, there is nothing in a soap bubble, it's air. So how to paint air, you know, is actually very hard for an artist. And Chardin did it brilliantly here. He manages also to uh, evoke the atmosphere of childhood, of childhood in the 18th century, his own time, and it's a very charming, very seductive picture. The artable carpets are stunning examples of extraordinary skill attained by weavers under the Safavid dynasty, which ruled Iran from 1501 to 1732. Their name comes from the shrine complex in Ardabil honoring Sheikh Safi. The carpets were probably originally made for a large octagonal building known as the Janat Sarai, the only structure at the complex large enough to house them side by side. In a cartouche at the top of each carpet is a couplet from an ode by the famous 14th century Persian poet, Hafez. Other than thy threshold, I have no refuge in this world. My head is no resting place other than this doorway. It is signed, Work of a Servant of the Court, Maksud of Kashan, in the year 946, a year that corresponds to 1539 to 1540 in the Western calendar. The Safavid rulers established royal workshops where carpet weaving evolved from a rural and nomadic craft to a national industry and an internationally acclaimed art form. This is a portrait of Sir Wyndham Natchbull Wyndham, painted in 1758 by a great artist from Italy, Pompeo Battoni. This is a fascinating picture because we know absolutely everything about it since the day it was painted. Natural Wyndham was a young English aristocrat who, like so many of his peers and contemporaries, went on a long journey called the Grand Tour. This, at the time, was considered to be part of a young aristocrat's education, to discover other languages, other cultures, and so on. 
And another thing that those young men did when they traveled, uh, as a souvenir, as it were, uh, they liked to have their portrait done in Italy. And why in Italy? Because in Italy there was this one artist, Pompeo Battoni, who was the most famous portrait painter of his time. So it was almost a status thing for these young men to go to Rome and to come back with the portrait, actual portrait in their suitcase. And as you can see, this portrait is a full-length portrait. That means that you see the whole figure from top to bottom. Uh, that was the most expensive kind of portrait you could commission. If you didn't have the kind of money to pay for a portrait of that, uh, of that statue, you would settle for a bust length if you want. But this one is uh, especially imposing. You see the sitter very beautifully dressed. I mean, uh, clearly he put on his best outfit to sit for the painter. The painter himself represented him in a kind of more or less idealized landscape that evokes antique Rome. There is a temple in the background. There is a bust of Athena. There are elements like this which indicate culture and a, and a certain style that was very becoming. Magritte's treachery of images, this is not a pipe, is really one of the great hallmarks of Lacma's collection. It's a piece which has really had such an influence on so many on so many artists, both at the time that Magritte painted it in the late 1920s and for many subsequent generations. It's a piece that calls into question the relationship between the sign and the signifier. I mean, what we see is an ordinary brown pipe and underneath it written in script are the the words in French this is not a pipe. Well of course it's not a pipe. It's a depiction of a pipe. I mean you can't smoke it. It's a depiction of a pipe. So it brings to mind for so many artists what is that relationship between the word and the image. And certainly many artists in the 1970s um, artists like Ed Ruscha, John Baldessari, Lawrence Wiener, many of the conceptual artists. For many artists, this is a provocative concept and one which has continued to inspire and provoke artists. And when people find it in our galleries, they're so stunned and they actually say, is this the original? And I like to say that, you know, Magritte often repeated himself. There are many different versions of it. But in fact, this is the original. These 11 pieces are a small sampling of the museum's vast encyclopedic collection. Come see the works which captivated the experts, and while you're here, discover your own magnificent 11.